Thank you very much for inviting me. The hospitality has been superb and warm. Um, and the papers have, so far have been really interesting. Um, but I feel a little bit like a charlatan because I haven't really worked on the Caribbean for a couple of years now. Um, but it's nice to be reminded that one should and could return to kind of material that one has been working on for some time um, because it's important and there needs to be much more work done. Okay, my own work recently has really been to look at educational publishing and globalization. Um, but when I asked Anne what should I speak about here, thinking, in, oh my God, what shall I say now that I've in accepted the inv invitation? She, says, she said to me, Re researchers don't always consult publishing archives. Would I say something about the use that is made of publishing archives? So my talk is really very simple and it's very practical in orientation. It gives you a, a sense of maybe some of the things can, that, can, that researchers are interested in um, as they trawl through publishing archives. I'm going to say a big apology to all of you who are book historians because you would have, you, all of this will be very familiar to you. Okay, so I've titled my talk Researching In, but it's more or less kind of adventures in almost publishers' archives. I deal in the main with publishers' archives, and I think the only author's papers I've, I've really had any um, joy in researching is, is Amos Tutola at the Harry Ransom Center. Could I have the next slide? Okay, and this is some of the material that's available in the UK that I've looked at, and these, this material is not exhausted by any chance. There are the Jonathan Cape papers at the University of Reading, special collections. I looked particularly at the Walcott um, papers, and there's quite a substantive collection there. I looked at the Henry Swansea papers at the University of Birmingham to do with Caribbean voices, but there are copies now at UWE um, in Trinidad. I looked at Heinemann Educational Books, primarily in the African Writers Series, but I also looked at the Caribbean Writers Series. I, I went up to um, the Random House Archive in Petersburg, just outside of Petersburg in Rushton, and they had the Hutchinson's New Authors, but this is mostly books. Um, there are maybe about a couple of files, very slim files, which don't say a lot on Andrew Salkey. Um, I've also been to the George Padmore Institute, and a lot of you who are Caribbeanists will know that Anne Walmsley's interviews are all archived at the um, Padmore Institute, but John LaRose's paper um, are also there. Um, then I've looked also, because I was quite interested some time ago in the West Indian Gazette, the newspaper that was actually um, published in Britain, the first West Indian newspaper that was published in Britain in um, 1959. Um, by Claudia Jones. I was quite interested, interested in that. And, and the race, so the Institute of Race Relations have um, a, an incomplete run, but most of it's there. And there is a microfiche collection as well, I think at the Lambeth um, Library. Um, could I have the next slide? Um, so here is, for example, um, an indication of, of um, the, the West Indian Gazette, edited by Claudia Jones, who was, of course, Trinidadian. Um, there are holdings there, and one can look for for that if one is interested in. This, is, this comes from the Institute of Race Relations. Um, I'll have the other slide. I just have some pictures. This is George Padmore Institute. I just put this up because then you can actually um, make connections with um, um, some of the, the holdings there, in part because when I, I think when I looked at the Diasporic Literary Archives, um, find it's location registers, most of it's on authors authors particularly, and I thought, well, what are some of the other kinds of things that one would need to factor in um, in order to make a sense of the kind of wider connection of where you can find material on actually writers' papers? So John LaRose and uh, et cetera, there's, a, there's lo a lot more um, um, that one can look at there. I'll have the next slide. Um, there's archives which I haven't looked at, the Jessica and, and Eric Huntley's papers at the London Metropolitan University, all of their Bogolo Overture um, publications um, are now deposited there, and of course the Andrew Salkey papers at the British Library, and again that's not open to the public, but Alison can say something a bit more about it, I think, because she's actually worked in, in that particular um, place. I'll have the next slide. Okay, I, this is a plea for actually thinking beyond simply authors' papers. Um, not only authors' papers, but to think of pub publishers, to think of the wider infrastructure, to think of the larger ecosystem that supports, if you like, 
um, writing. So this is a, these are some of the other archives you might want to think about putting the location register or just thinking about if you're actually looking um, to do research work on particular writers. There's the London Magazine archives, which has, of course, Walcott had contributed quite a bit, and there's a substantive on, ongoing record of his relationship with um, um, Andrew Ross, first of all, John Lehman, who took his six poems right at the start of his career, but also Andrew Ross, who then became a long-standing kind of mentor of early Walcott. Um, there's also the Arthur Ravenscroft papers. Arthur Ravenscroft was um, a South African his, um, academic who was based at Leeds, who was responsible with um, Norman Jeffras for starting ACHELS, which is the Association of um, Commonwealth Literature and Languages and language study. Um, and his papers, again, a record of some of those correspondence is, is actually quite useful if you are interested in kind of Caribbean material, um, because of course he published um, the journal Commonwealth um, Literature. There's the National Archives, it's Q, and, and I've only put this because I was quite interested in the 1965 um, Commonwealth Arts Festival, of which Walcott was actually in, in uh, did contribute a, a kind of long poem. And he was also invited to the, Ver the Verse and Voice Festival. He made a big protest about it because, of course, the 1965 um, was the year of the Commonwealth Immigration Act. And his protest is kind of in the, Jama in the Trinidadian papers. I think I'm not quite sure where it is now. I, I, do, I do have um, a little record of that. But um, again, one can see that kind of correspondence. So it's, it's a plea for thinking outside, if you like, simply writers' um, uh, writers' papers. I was interested in William Plumer as, um, I suppose, a publisher reader rather than than um, um, a writer. Willem Plumer is um, a, is South African as well as British. Um, he he was born in Britain and I think migrated spent his early childhood in South Africa and returned to Britain via Japan. And he worked, um, he hooked up with the Bloomsbury set and is, is quite well known for his, his, relation, his relationship and his work with the Hogarth Press. But he also um, functioned essentially as, I think from the 1940s, in the post-war period certainly, he functioned essentially as a kind of um, a, a publisher's reader for Jonathan Cape. So I was really interested in Plumer as a publisher's reader in terms of kind of gatekeeping practices and facilitating work from particular parts of the world. Um, there's the Oxford University Press Archives, and it's a game to think about, outs but to think about educational publishing as, as also in some ways a having a, a treasure trove of papers rather, sim rather than simply, if you like, um, author's archives. So Camus Braithwaite, some of the editorial correspondence um, is present in the Oxford University Press Archives because, of course, he was published um, both as an Oxford poet, but also um, he had a, 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 an interesting relationship with John Stallsworthy. Um, so think about education, publishing archives, Longman, Heinemann educational books, and these are at Reading, but also Thomas Nelson, who obviously, um, this is Trinidad, you would know that Thomas Nelson published um, the Cutter's Readers, and there's a, a lot of correspondence going back and forth on that front as well. Can I have the next slide? Um, this is, um, I suppose I've been influenced, although when I started my research project, when I started being interested in this, I, was, I wasn't aware of this, but this has been quite influential and kind of may, maybe reminding me of that kind of life cycle of the book. So this is Roger Danton's, and all book historians would know this is kind of foundational essay in book history, what is the history of the book, starting from authors to publishers, to printers, to shippers, to distributors, the whole shebang of it. And that's, this is about tracking the life cycle of a book. Um, and there are, of course, slight emendations and, and um, revisions to the original communication circuit. This is um, Thomas Adams and Nicholas Barker. But there's, of course, also Pierre Bordeaux. I don't have a pretty picture for it, so I haven't put it on. But there's also Pierre Bordeaux's um, um, distinction and his idea of thinking about publishing as, in some ways, a literary field where people jostle particularly for positions and how each writer, each publisher coming on the market will actually also have to compete in that same hierarchical um, um, structure. Okay, I'll have a next one. Um, so in terms of publishing, what I'm interested in particular is the gatekeeping functions of publishers um, and publishers' readers. Um, but not only gatekeeping, facilitating, I suppose, is the other way to think about it. So publishers' readers as providing, if you like, the first gateway you pass through in order to get your book considered for print. 
I'm quite interested in, in the debates that have been current over the last 10, 12 years with the publication of Postcolonial Exotic, quite interested in the factors impacting on the decision to publish, because publishing is also about the business of books, it's not simply about good writing. Um, so that the, the whole debates around the postcolonial exotic, what travels well, what doesn't travel well, what is local, what reaches a, a, an, an audience that's outside the particular locality one comes from is all really interesting. And some of that can be tracked through, if you like, those kinds of reader's reports on um, manuscripts coming in. Um, the readers reports also give you a sense of the kind of possible readers, the kind of audiences that particular book might be targeted and marketed at. Um, I'm interested also in publisher house identities um, and publisher series and how effectively that affects the way one might actually receive um, a particular um, book. I'm also interested in patronage and literary, ma literary networks, particularly, and one can think of Walker as a classic example of that, as in some, ways, in some ways aided into print by not only his talent, but actually by a whole series of connections that he had with particular writers, particular um, critics, particular publishers, etc. And I'm going to say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, I'm really interested in the impact of editing because it's, it's about thinking about the book not simply as final finished form, or what Ken Ramchand said this morning about the final digital product. This is, I would like to think of book as kind of material process so that one can actually map the stages of it and the, the various contributions that various people have made um, in, the various in the life cycle of the book, if you like. So the impact of editors have been, you know, that's a really fascinating area. If you think about the debates about um, how to edit for a particular market, and the only writer I've worked on um, is not Caribbean, um, in relation to this area, it's Amos Tutola, but Amos Tutola is almost, um, 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 you know, almost an exceptional case. And I was interested in how Faber actually edited his manuscript, Alan Pringle, who was the editor at Faber. So I was able to look at the original manuscript and then the, the emendations and the corrections that Faber had put, uh, that Faber had crossed out, etc., on the actual handwritten manuscript. And you find, for example, that they, they, um, I mean, if, I, I don't know if any of you know Amos Tutola, he, he did write in a, a very non-standard English, and Faber did try and preserve some of that. So I was trying to understand the process of why certain, certain sentences and syntaxes were correct and others weren't. And actually, it's quite an interesting process of thinking of how, um, um, how you might pitch that particular writer, which you are selling as essentially a naive artist for, if you like, um, and a naive artist who is in some ways exotic or writing a young English. So even the title, The Palm Wine Drinker, it's in some ways you can see um, Jeffrey Faber's um, little comments on the manuscript saying, um, you know, let's keep drink hard, the, the misspelling of The Palm Wine Drinker, let's keep drink hard, and the drinker crossed out as drink hard. So in fact, in the, in the published version, you do not see any you know, you don't see the, the various variation of the spellings of drink, drinker, drunkard, you just simply see drinkard. So that's again quite interesting, this whole idea of how you actually in some ways edit for a particular kind of audience and what kind of writer you want to, to, to essentially sell this, this particular um, um, manuscript as. I'm also interested in obviously the, 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 the whole, um, the whole debates about book covers and what book covers do in, t in terms of the reception of the book. So I'm, look so I'm interested in the look and the feel of a text, but also essentially the debates around book covers and how you pitch certain book covers for particular niche audiences. Um, and finally, interested, although this is a new, uh, this is an area I've only just started to work in, the relationship between publishing and that larger infrastructure, but particularly with, with literary prizes, because literary prizes are almost like, um, fashion shows at the moment, each year on year, you know, one parades, if you like, this, this kind of coterie of short lists and long lists, and that's a way of drumming up kind of the audience for, for that particular cluster of books, and how publishers collude with, if you like, that, that whole process. Okay, the next slide. Um, I thought what I'd do is actually give you a couple of readers' reports, some of which you'll know because um, either it's in my book or it's in... Um, Bruce King's book, or is in Peter Kelly's book. This is the publisher's reader's report um, on Walcott's first um, oh. manuscript, In a Green Night, um, that was sent to William Cape. 
Um, I'm just going to read it out to you, and it's it's uh, and I I have found it really interesting. And this is Plumer um, writing. I need not draw attention to the doubtful returns to be expected from a published book of verse by a new poet. But when the poet has exceptional talents and accomplishment, there is a good chance of immediate recognition and a possibility of long-term advantage. And here, there's this whole discussion about, well, is poetry economical? Well, poetry is worth publishing because of the cultural capital that accrues to having really good poets on your list. And of course, Cape is a publisher, is a general publisher that publishes kind of Bond novels as much as other kinds of writing. Um, I have already seen some of this author's work, have thought it quite outstanding, and have found it very well thought of by a number of our poets, not merely at the London Magazine. And then he quotes, um, the best prospect I know, says Alan Ross. And again, one can see about this kind of validation by a larger literary establishment of a particular writer's work, um, which has printed some of Walcott's work. Walcott is 30, and it's so far as I can see the best poet in English of his generation. He is a West Indian, evidently crossbred or mulatto, since he writes of racial conflicts inside himself. Um, for example, between African and West Indian allegiances of an anti-colonial nature and his passionate use of the English language and literature. Internal evidence suggests that he is Roman Catholic, which of course he wasn't, who has lost his faith um, and he is highly literate as a poet and that he has been as much open to French as to English literary influences. And this plugs Walcott into a, a kind of, I suppose, a kind of well-established um, tradition of English writing, really. And here is William Plume, in some ways, arguing for Walcott as part of that particular English literary tradition. And um, I think Dylan Brown has written a, um, in his new book on metro migrant modernism, has talked about this in particular. Okay. Um, again, just to continue that little kind of um, um, section of acceptances, much of the imagery of his poems is tropical or subtropical or Caribbean. They are not obscure and are invariably interesting, full of a pleasing sensuousness and the work of a man with a clear intelligence, sensibility, powers of observation and a good ear. Almost every poem has memorable lines and images and the poems are various retrospective <laughs> love poems, elegiac, satirical, and the work of an original poet with a fine technique. I have no idea how he will develop or whether he intends only to write poetry, but I have no doubt that he would have, he would have no difficulty in finding a good publisher. And here you can feel that Plume is really making a case for, for um, supporting uh, Walcott, publishing Walcott, but I have no doubt that he would have no difficulty in finding a good publisher here. And I should like to see Cape as his publisher. I think his work, even if it doesn't at once Pay, and this is really interesting, this whole idea of, of the cultural capital that accrues to poetry, pay would, would give prestige to Cape's list in which poetry is believed at present, oh, it's, sorry, in which poetry is, I believe, at present only represented by the dead and the middle-aged. It can be reasonably expected that the book might come in for some poetry book society choice of recommendation or for some literary, um, some literature prize. And of course, um, one knows from um, kind of Plumer's behind the scenes kind of um, machinations or kind of gradual kind of um, 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 support of Walcott that actually he was quite instrumental in, in, in actually suggesting, Walcott, suggesting Walcott's name for a number of literary prizes early in his career. Okay. Um, this, uh, I knew that that the, the manuscript was sent also to Alfred Knopf, and this, is, this was my big find. Um, I knew the manuscript was also sent to Alfred Knopf after Cape had accepted it, and I was interested in the rejections, if you like, on the other end of that, that particular circuit. And of course, A Walker was published by um, um, Farrar, Guru, and Strauss, and that's because of his connection with Robert Lowell. Um, here's a rejection by Judith Jones, who's one of the actual big editors, one of the founding editors, I'm not really sure. Um, um, of the, the company Alpha North. Um, and there are two parts to this. One is the general rejection, which then is the write-up, and one is um, the actual, if you like, the publisher's reader's report, or publisher's stroke editor, because Judith Jones was also an editor of Alpha North. Um, this is her report itself. So I'll start with, I'll just read her report. The general report actually uses some of the words that she does, so I know that in, in some ways it's an amalgamation of, of things. So this was received uh, um, 
on the 15th of November 1961, um, and it was read by Judith Jones. I'm not sold on this young West Indies English, it went, sorry, I'm not sold on this young West Indies born English poet. And I'm thinking, what does she mean here? You know, what does that really mean? I mean, because, um, granted that his subject matter is different and he's not, be, he's not afraid of being polemical and sentimental, which is a new tone in modern English verse. But frankly, I don't think he's a first-rate poet, judging from a quick look at his work. And you think, oh, what has she missed in the generations of that? But this is, this is the part that's really interesting for me, but I haven't done enough work to be able to contextualize um, the kinds of things that she's thinking, that her thinking behind, if you are, a statement like this. His ear is often flat and prosy, and he does not manage to make his colloquialisms and folk material really come above in the language of his poetry. And if you remember, in Plumer's poetry, it's very much about actually Walker linking into, um, a, you know, almost like a modernist, a high modernist generation of English writing. And here is, is Judith Jones actually going opposite the other way, if you like, thinking about the colloquialism and the folk material that comes above in the language of poetry. And then just to finish off, he hits often upon superb lines, but the poems are not sustained either rhythmically or in terms of the fully contained vision, and too often he resorts to the obvious. I'd like to see his work again, but this does not strike me as a consistently good enough first collection to take on now. And interesting, and, and the joy about working in the publisher's um, readers' um, files is that you, you see these rejection letters of really what is completely famous writers now. Um, and you also see the, the terms of the de debate and how they actually think about how a writer might or might not fit into the house, if you like, the house list. Can I have? <coughs> so the, in the Green Eye was published in 1962, in April 1962, and, and a lot of this information is kind of perfectly, um, in some ways, it it's, um, can be found in the Cape archives, but I suspect also in um, Bruce, Bruce's King's biography. Um, was published 2,000 copies in sheets, first of all. Only, fifth, only 500 was actually bound initially, so they, they were hedging their bets, if you like. Um, Kate was hedging their bets at that time. 588 copies sold by 5th July, so you know it, it's promising, but not kind of spectacular. Reprints actually fur much further down the line in, 50, uh, in 69, sorry, in 67 and, and 69. Um, so it tells you a little bit of, you know, the next book that Kate come, that comes to Kate, the next manuscript that comes into Kate, Kate might really think about, if you like, the worth of this particular writer. Um, the literary networks around Walcott are all really important to establishing his reputation um, at the start of his career. And one thinks of Frank Collymore with, with, um, 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 the, with BIM, um, writing to Swansea, introducing his work, um, one thinks of Roy Fuller, who then Swansea kind of co-ops in order to kind of promote Walcott's material. One thinks of John Lehman, who then um, takes Walcott's material, six poems for the London Magazine. Alan Ross, who then becomes a champion of Walcott at the London Magazine. But also William Plumer, as I've said, and then Robert Lowell, who was a really instrumental for that, that American publishing kind of contact. Um, one also wants to think of Willem Plumer, who's really interesting as a character, as essentially Walcott's, although he was a publisher's reader, he was also a publisher's reader's, reader in the sense of being Walcott's advocate at Jonathan Cape. So he wrote Walcott's blurbs, for example, at the back. You can see that the, the actual reader's reports actually are, some of the phrases of the reader's report are reproduced in the actual blurbs itself. Um, you can also see in another uh, really interesting kind of conversation or letter exchange over um, Walcott's kind of um, Wordsworthian poem, <clears throat> almost like the Preludes, Another Country, in which the first, um, the first version of the manuscript was actually sent to Cape, um, and Plumer, Plumer's report, Plumer was slightly doubtful about it, um, and there was an exchange between Tom Mashler, who was editor at um, John and Cape, and Plumer about it, um, and I'll just read up that later on. But the long and short of it is that actually um, they sent it back to Walcott because Plumer thought actually it would damage Walcott's reputation. Now, I've never been able to find the actual, the actual letter that Plumer sends Walcott, but we know that Walcott actually took the manuscript back and actually revised the actual um, long poem. And of course, um, Plumer was instrumental in, in, in uh, he was one of the judges for the, the Chumley Prize, um, which was awarded at Walcott in 1969. Okay, um, I don't, I think I'm probably going to run out of time soon. 
Um, this, if anyone's interested, is in the Swansea collection. This is Frank Collymore writing to um, Henry Swansea about Walcott. Um, I'll have the next slide. Anyone's interested in this, I'll just send it to you. And again, um, this, I'll just read out the, 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 the little section in blue. I intend to show you show your collection to Roy Fuller, who has some interest in publishers, and wonder if he thinks as highly of them as I do, whether you would consent to having them sent to a publisher in England. This is, this is Henry Swansea, if you like, writing back to Walcott. If you have not already done so, I realize the problems and temptations that such a development might well cause a writer like you, like yourself, wise enough to realize the strength of isolation. But I think you owe it to readers of contemporary English poetry. And again, one can see how you know, that this kind of writing really enmeshes, um, interfaces with what's, what's going on in the UK. Okay. Um, this, is, this is Tom Mashler in, in the whole kind of exchange about another country. This is Tom Mashler to Walcott. Willem Plume is writing to you a more technical letter than I could write, and he makes, I think, some important points. I want you to know how much we admire your work and that if you are not ready to take William's advice, we will publish another life as it is. And then Walcott replies and says, after patient and painful reflection on what William Plumer has written about in another life, I agree with most of his criticism. But I actually don't know what that criticism was. I haven't found that letter. So if anyone knows of that letter, of that letters in this archive, please let me know. I'd be really Swansea. interested in that. Um, it's also worth saying that um, Swansea did receive um, Walcott's novel, which was, I have found this in my notes. I did ask the question. It's called um, Passage to Paradise, and it was sent in 1952. And again, I, you know, I have no trace of the novel. I don't know, you know, no other reference to it after um, um, Swansea's, Swansea received the manuscript, then it was sent to John Lehman, and it was sent to Jonathan Cape as well. So again, if anyone knows of that particular novel or manuscript, that's, you know, this is the only Walcott novel that would be, if you like, and it would be so interesting to see what was actually in. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap up. I'm, um, these are the networks. If you, one can chart, if you like, the networks of friendship and uh, about a politics of patronage, really. I think it's really interesting to think about how writers come into, <clears throat> come to be published and come to be championed and on what terms. Um, some of this actually is, um, the, uh, the, the actual narrative of this is available in obviously um, Bruce King's kind of um, slightly problematic biography of, of um, Derek Walcott. Um, this is the Castaway Report, um, um, Plumer's Report, um, and interesting again, the, the, what I've outlined, the, 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 the insertion of Walcott into a kind of English literary tradition, instinctive tradition, command of idiomatic English and literary instinct. And one again can see that Walcott's champion on certain kinds of terms. But equally, one can actually think about this as a way of Plumer making a case for, rather than simply reading it as it is, making a case for Walcott to Tom Mashler. Um, OK, a couple of slides to end with, and I'm actually winding up now. And this is about the general sense of um, the politics of location and diasporic archives. So the plea is not only to look at authors' papers and only to collect information about authors' papers, but also to look at publishers' archives, to look at publishers' series and how an author might fit or may, or may not fit within publishers' series, and information about anthologies that are produced by publishers' series that actually give interesting curricular and pedagogical kind of information that actually sets up, if you like, canonical traditions in, um, in, in particular Caribbean writing, for example. <coughs> Um, I think also one can think about the interesting discussions over who and what to exclude in these particular anthologies and in educational material because, again, that's really at the ground level and that in some ways has much more dramatic impact than at a higher end of publishing. I'm also interested in literary agents and agencies, and actually, in some ways, I think that authors' papers ought to dovetail with kind of knowledge of, of um, literary agents and literary agencies and the input they have, particularly in editorial matters, but also kind of championing, if you like, um, a writer's being advocate for writers. Um, I'm really interested, I think you also need to think about the literary infrastructures. I'm really interested in the kinds of um, comments Nicholson made about um, the current crop of Caribbean writers in Trinidad, for example, um, about that whole literary e ecosystem and these structures of support that are so very crucial to grow, if you like, that literary culture. 
And finally, because I'm also a bit historian, although I've not really worked on this as much, I'm interested in what readers do with books. You know, what, how do readers receive these books? I mean, there's the Open University Reading Database, which looks, at, which is not the most dare I say it on camera, <laughs> not the most useful kind of collection of data, but something that actually allows one to track what, pe you know, what people think of certain kinds of things that will open up in a much more democratic way, if you like, um, one's relationship to um, um, important writing. Um, and because what you're dealing he with here and now, particularly with the contemporary writers, is really a transnational and diasporic kind of element in which mobility and internationalism is, is kind of almost like a given now. This, you know, there isn't a writer who, who doesn't jet all over the world once he or she um, reputation is established, who gets invited to, um, to, to give talks, etc. Um, all of that in relation to the kinds of things that might restrict the idea of, um, or w which would cast location in a slightly, diff a slightly problematic way. Because one thinks of location as essentially kind of material that's housed or preserved in specific locales, and the whole infrastructure and funding support that actually helps um, locate particular author, literary manuscripts, publishing archives at a particular location. There are all sorts of interesting kind of debates to be had about ownership, of course, and we've heard a little bit about that this morning. The archive is kind of a repository of national or cultural memory. The kind of political and cultural sensitivities around actually who buys what, who is allowed to acquire what, and um, what the politics of, of those debates are. And of course, there's also this question about intellectual property and how, how much open access um, do you allow in relation to readers coming in doing that work. And of course, once you acquire the work, the archive itself has commercial value, not only kind of aesthetic and literary value, but it also has commercial value, and it also has kind of value added value almost, in which writers and other kinds of readers might come to your, your particular archive to, if you like, um, look at, um, find research, look at the actual papers, etc. So on the one hand, there is a tension between that, that kind of mobility and the, the fact that writers go, you know, they live in very different camps, they have very different cultural allegiances, they move around all the time, particularly for, com, for contemporary writers, and all the other questions that actually one has to think about in order to think about where one might want to deposit. But here's, here's my kind of rather awkward and rather kind of um, utopic kind of um, response to all of this particular difficulty is that I'm actually in some ways only talking about a user's perspective, kind of the, the kind of work that I've been interested in in relation to archive. So my question is, well, how do you turn information simply to flows and, and how to stop thinking about location simply as location, simply as static? How do you think of location as essentially a kind of nodal point for very different cultural transfers, if you like, very different ways of thinking about information flows? So my last slide, I think, is on is making a pitch from a user's perspective for much more, of course, and it's been said already this morning, quite a bit of it, um, in terms of the digital, uh, di digitalized, digitized content of archives, to digitalize much more of it. And, you know, the, the, the work of DLOC ha has been really amazing. I mean, I've been able to trawl through the history of Trinidad in kind of education because it, there's a little fly on that on DLOC. Um, so sharing that kind of digital content has been really useful for scholars, readers, um, not only kind of um, scholars, but also kind of general readers. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm not an archivist myself, so all of this intervention, all of my, my kind of two pennies worth of interventions is really from a user's perspective. But I guess I would say that maybe now there's much more sharing and partnerships of different archival material. Um, um, that makes it, that make information flow much more. But I want to ask um, whether there's any mileage in, I was having a conversation with Andrew Nash earlier yesterday about whether there would be any mileage in not only giving a kind of location register um, of archival papers which are author based, but also factoring in at some other level not maybe not the top level, but some of the level, the kind of use that have been made of that particular archive. Because it seems to me, as a, as a reader in archives, I'm constantly reinventing the wheel. And I, actually, someone else 
uh, some, most of the time someone else that's already been there before me. I mean, sometimes that's not the case because I've been to the, you know, looked at David Hyam papers and it's uncatalogued so no one's been there before and they've only just acquired it. But most often there is someone already who has had um, a feel of or a, a, a preliminary look um, at the material there and may or may not have a scholarly paper published on, on that particular archive. And it will be useful to have that factored into you know, at a, at a different level, maybe not at a top level, but at a different level of, of, of actually um, thinking about the kind of usage that's made of archives. This also lets you get around the kind of question, the tricky notion of intellectual property, I think, um, insofar as, as um, you can't, you, you know, digitizing material requires that intellectual property in some ways be managed in a certain kind of way, but that may not entirely be true if you look at scholarly papers who, who quote particular sections from, from archives. Okay, um, so that's a plea for me as a user of an archive, actually to have very different levels, not only kind of um, author's papers, but also, if you like, other kind of literary infrastructures, but in the end also to think about a user and what users are made of archives, both scholarly as well as readerly. I am there. Thank you for listening.